Good morning, friends. Welcome back to your favorite class, composites. Yes. All right. Uh, I'm putting together your next. It's going to be on woven materials and sandwich structures. Coming out probably today, maybe tomorrow. It's going to be due next Wednesday. It's going to be chill. All right. Real simple. Probably a lot of qualitative type questions. Not a lot of quantitative stuff. Uh, Kind of chilling. I know you guys got a bunch of like finals and stuff going on next week, so I'm trying to chill a little bit. All right. So that's that. Uh, and then the other announcement is that your exam for this class, the last exam, is obviously next week, Friday during lecture. All right. So we'll talk more about that as it comes, but it's just going to work basically like the exact that we had for the last exam. OK, so a lot to get through. I want to just get right to it. Let us do that. Someone in my uh, my dynamics class made this meme. <laughs> it's the Doge meme. Favorite class, much math, rar. All right. Last time we were here, all gathered together, far away from each other, we were talking about uh, woven composites. And I didn't. I don't think I did a very good job explaining, like, technically what a woven composite is. Um, I sort of wrote it, but uh, it's a composite made from an architecture that has um, some interlocked fabric. All right. So we looked at a couple of different uh, fabric architectures at the beginning of class, eh, kind of throughout class on Monday. And those fiber architectures looked something like this. And so I want to just be very clear here. And I don't know if I was perfectly clear about this on Monday, uh, that like the one dimensional architecture, you know, which is like a unidirectional. All right, this is not a woven architecture. So you cannot make a woven structure with a unidirectional stack, all right? So unidirectional layers stacked on top of each other is not a woven composite. There's not like this interlocking of individual fibers in a particular layer. So that's a not woven or a non-woven structure. So I just want to get that straight away. Uh, the rest of these guys, they're all woven. So if you made composites with those particular fabrics, you would have what is classified as a woven composite. All right. So uh, we first talked about these one dimensional architectures, but I didn't spend too much time on that because we talked about unidirectional composites like to death in this class. All right. They're what make up the laminates that we've been doing analysis on since like week number one. We talked about hydrothermal stresses, failure stresses, you know, engineering properties of laminates, yada, 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 yada. We've beaten these guys pretty much to death with our classical lamination theory. Uh, what I spent a little more time on on Monday was the two-dimensional architectures, which are here. All right, so these two-dimensional architectures, the most common, obviously, is going to be this bi-directional weave, which incorporates things like a plane weave, satin weave, twill weave, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so I don't know if this is going to, like, show up very well. I'm going to, like, try to do this, uh, but I have here some fabric swatches. It'd be better if I could just, like, pass these around, but, you know, the world is what it is right now. All right, so I have these fabric swatches. This here is unidirectional derived fabric. So you can see that like the fibers really only like run in one direction. So this is one type of unidirectional fabric from um, fiberglass. You see the fibers only going in one direction, kind of like this longitudinal direction. On the back side here, this is kind of an interesting thing about unidirectional fabrics is that they have this like white cross toe. This does not make them a unit or, or a woven fabric. OK, so this this white cross toe is just kind of like used to hold the dry fabric together. Right. So if you just had a unidirectional material and you were trying to hold it, has no reason to like stay together. All right. So it has these like white binder toes. And so when you're buying dry unidirectional fabric, you might see something like a cross stitch density of like one percent. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about this white cross stitch that's like holding it together. All right, so this is what it looks like uh, on the surface. Fiber is only running in one direction. That obviously varies from something like this. This is a four harness satin weave. 
All right. So four over, one under, four over, one under, obviously this woven pattern. All right. And so that is the difference between like a unidirectional fabric and a woven fabric. And you can also talk about like making some crazy stuff with these woven fabrics with like multi-material. So this is a twill weave with Kevlar and carbon fiber. So you can see two over, two under, two over, two under. And the cross fabric is different from, you know, the warp is different from the weft, right? So I'm not sure which fiber was the warp and which fiber was the weft in this particular manufacturer, but you get the general idea. There's all these sort of like crazy exotic fabrics that you could use to make composites and they all have different properties and different uses and different drapabilities and all these sorts of good things that we've, we've talked about in the past. All right. So yesterday I mostly talked about uh, two-dimensional, or Monday I mostly talked about two-dimensional composites, their benefits and their drawbacks, and we talked about how to manufacture two-dimensional composites, and so we talked about words like warp and weft. We showed pictures and videos of a loom, and so how the fabric is actually manufactured. It's all like useful things to know if you're going to like work in the industry of composites and someone says to you like what's the strength in the warp direction, what's the strength in the weft direction then you can say, I understand what that means. I know what you're talking about. You can read a data sheet where the data sheets show things like warp and weft information and just all that general good stuff. All right, so we're gonna continue the conversation now and move towards three-dimensional composites. All right, so that's where we begin new material today is 3D fabric architectures. All right, we've already talked about this a little bit when we were in the fracture portion of this course, because one of the methods that we discussed for increasing toughness of two-dimensional composites is to incorporate stitches and Z-pins through the thickness to stop crack propagation. So I'll say that incorporating stitches and Z-pins is like cheating, all right? It's like an asterisk, because you're like deforming the fibers in the plant. So it's like, uh, it's like the steroids era, you know, there's just an asterisk next to everything. Here, we have an asterisk here because we're incorporating stitches and pins, it's, it's cheating. So I'll say something like pseudo three D composites have been around since like the 70s, the early 70s. And why I say pseudo is because people have been stitching and Z-pinning 2D composites since that time. So this is strictly stitching and Z-pinning. Okay, so there's not a loom that was capable of making a true three-dimensional woven architecture until like the early 2000s, all right? So this, technology of like 3D woven composites is like very new and it's actually what I wrote my PhD dissertation on so it's like real new all right so a true 3D weave not patented until like the early 2000s almost 2010 all right, and that patent actually comes from the U.S., which is a little bit strange because the United States typically doesn't have a lot of like manufacturing patents. Well, not as many of these more these days as like some of the other countries like developing China and et cetera. Uh, our, our patents these days tend to be more things like technology related. Uh, but here are some excerpts from the patent uh, from 2009. All right, so here specifically, 3D woven fabrics and methods for thick preforms. All right, so these are specifically for making composite woven structures. So woven structures that will become three-dimensional composites. All right, so we see here this company in North Carolina called 3 Tex put this together. And I've been to 3 Tex and I've seen the looms there and they are insane, okay? Crazy. Filed in 2007 and actually full patent in 2009, all right? So what you're showing here is they're talking about in this particular patent how to create three-dimensional woven structures without pinning or stitching the fabric directly. And we know that that causes problems with like in-plane distortion and things like that. All right. So here we see the patent that shows like here, this is your through thickness Z-toe here. 
which runs through the material. Here's like one of the toes in this direction, which here's the weft toe. So that's coming across the fabric during production. And then this guy here is this toe in the warp direction. All right, so we see the three directions of the fibers creating a three-dimensionally woven fabric. All right, this is called a uh, 3D orthogonal weave. There are even now only a handful of looms in the world that can make 3D orthogonal weave composites, which is kind of crazy. I don't know what the number is now. When I was in graduate school, it was three, okay? I'm guessing now there are probably dozens, but... Ooh, even that's probably a stretch. Maybe a dozen would be a good guess. All right. Now, 3D composites have benefits and drawbacks, just like unidirectional composites have benefits and drawbacks. All right. And interestingly, in the patent, they actually point out what they know to be a big drawback about 3D composites, which I think is interesting that if you're trying to sell something and patent something, that you point out a negative aspect of it. Like, what are these idiots doing? They're like the worst salesman in history. All right. But here they talk about empty pockets inside of the fabric architecture, which will be filled with epoxy resin during the composite manufacture. So even here in this patent, they're already able to understand that there are going to be a lot of empty spaces or what we call interstitial regions inside of the fabric that will just be there to sort of like hold resin. And we know that empty space inside of a composite where we just have epoxy resin is going to just tank your volume fraction okay so we want as many fibers in a small space as possible but because of the way that this 3d fabric is woven it just ends up that you have a lot of these open interstitial regions which really like minimizes your volume fraction all right so 3d weaves many open spaces between woven toes. And we call these interstitial regions. T-I-A-L, regions. Spelling, again, not my strong, not my strong suit. You guys have all seen that shirt where it's like, I'm an engineer and an engineer spelled wrong or crossed out. I'm an engineer, engineer spelled wrong or crossed out. Engineer spelled wrong or crossed out and then says, I'm good at math. Yeah, that's how I feel. Spelling is hard. Math, not so hard. All right. So there's many of these open spaces between woven toes, which we call interstitial regions. And after manufacture, filled with pure epoxy. Okay, so this minimizes the volume fraction of 3D composites. All right, I would say the max is like 50%. Maybe if you're applying insane amounts of pressure during the process, you could get to like 55%. But that's like absolute max. Any more pressure than that, you're going to start breaking fibers during fiber, during the manufacturing process. All right. So we know unidirectional composites, in theory, can get up to like the high 70%. All right. So if you're talking about a difference in in-plane properties, the unidirectional composites going to just crush three-dimensional composites, all right? But three-dimensionally woven composites have this extra benefit of this through-thickness toe that gives you insanely massive increases in fracture toughness and delamination resistance, all right? So let's look at a picture of the differences in the weaving between 2D and 3D woven, just so you get an idea for like how these guys are actually made. This time on how it's made. Three-dimensionally woven composites. All right. I feel like I'm on like TLC or something. Today on how it's made. 
Wait till we get to sandwich structures. God damn. Today on how it's made. All right, so here's your weaving process. We've talked about 2D already. You have like this separation between what are the warp toes and then the weft is inserted from the side using that high speed um, rapier. Uh, and then this shed shuttles the, the individual fibers up and down and you insert from side to side to side to side. All right, this guy, holy moly, complicated. All right, you've got multi insertions of, of weft toes in this guy as it, as it moves through. All right, so you have like multiple weft layers which are being inserted at any particular time. You're trying to balance that with holding what will become the Z toes with another apparatus in this loom, uh, all while still maintaining all the tension on many, many layers of warp toes. God damn. All right, you got crazy loom. I mean, this this loom, you should see it. It is enormous. It's like an elephant, okay? I feel like it's just going to rear its trunk and blow water on me. It's like enormous, all right? It's so really kind of cool to see this actual manufacturing if you get a chance. Uh, so that's kind of the difference in, in how they're made. Uh, just so you get some like practical application and why it's so difficult. It's like holding all these things steady while you're doing this weeding process. It's just like, god damn, insane. All right. So what you end up with, more pictures. We all love pictures. Rawr. Here's your unit cell of what a 3D woven composite looks like with appropriate terms like warp and weft and zeto. All right, so I've shown this in the past, but just to make sure that we're all clear on this, you've got the warp toes, which are like here in green. So these are like these long blue toes in this image up here. They're sort of being held by the loom and, and being held in tension during the entire process. All right, then the weft toes are inserted from the side with some apparatus. It's like the pink toes that you sort of see up here. All while the, the Z toes are being held and inserted in a sort of a different fashion. All right, so these Z toes here, they're coming through this guy just like that. It's got this wave structure inside the piece. All right, so there's your kind of a unit cell for this 3D woven composite. And this is like before resin infusion. Obviously infusion will happen later. And then this is what the material actually looks like. This is a picture of it. It's a glass 3D orthogonal weave. All right, so here you see these guys like poking their heads out from below. Those are the Z toes, all right? And those have kind of like this wave pattern that you can sort of see. And then you see these long guys here. All right, those are your weft toes. And then underneath you see these guys here. That's your warp. All right, so there, there's your three-dimensional fabric architecture, what it actually looks like, and uh, the unit cell of it. If you were to make a composite with this and look at a cross-section, it would look something like this. This is actually a very high resolution image. This image is enormous. You could zoom in pretty far on this and still get really good resolution. But what you're looking at here is you have, uh, here's your Z toe that's coming through the fabric. We've got one like uh, warp toe that's kind of interrupting the, the Z toe there. But here, this is your Z toe. All, right. All these guys here that are coming into and out of the board. These are your left toes. And then the guys that are coming across the face here, you can sort of faintly see them. These are the warp toes. All right, so we see the three directions of the fibers. And what you'll notice in this particular image is that there is a lot of extra epoxy, like a lot. All right, so all these regions here, like this whole region here is excess epoxy. It's like unreinforced epoxy. You know, we know unreinforced epoxy, terrible. All right, here's some more. Here's a bunch more over here. You get the general idea, unreinforced epoxy, a lot of it. And generally 
not good for mechanical properties. In the plane, that is. All right, so there you go with a three-dimensional woven composite material cross-section. All right, now you've got this fabric and you want to make a composite out of it, you're really limited to what you can do. So here you've got this really thick fabric. I mean, this is like a quarter inch thick, right? Like this, this preform, all right? Look at this, you know, this cross-section here. This is one millimeter with this scale bar and so you see this woven structure is this is like four millimeters thick. All right, so a four millimeter thick preform, I mean, that's that's like an eighth inch, more than an eighth of an inch. Like the drapability of that is like nothing. Okay, you can't drape that over any molds. That's impossible, right? Uh, so you, when it comes to manufacturing these guys, you're really limited in what you can do. So manufacturing considerations. All right, these 3D preforms are thick. Uh, anywhere from one eighth to one half inch thick. I mean, I've seen some real, real thick 3D woven preforms. It's like insane. All right, because of that, there's like basically zero drapability. Okay. very minimal drapability you, you, you can't get it around a curved surface or like the radius of curvature of this is like just very very small okay so bad for curved surfaces because of that it's usually manufactured as like a plate or something with very little curvature When we're talking about actually manufacturing this, like I said, we're limited to what we can do just because of the natural architecture. Um, there's lots of empty space between these individual toes. And so you have to get like epoxy in there through some infiltration method, all right? So the only real manufacturing methods that you have for this three-dimensional woven structure is some sort of infusion method. So only manufacturing methods. Are really, it's just RTM and Vardom. You need to somehow inject or infuse or draw in the liquid resin into all that empty space. Uh, you can't really do it with many, many of the manufacturing processes. Like you can't do filament winding with this. Like imagine trying to trying to wind this fabric around a mandrel. It's impossible. You're not going to be able to do that. All right, and then. You just can't do it. Can't do it. All right. It's really only RTM and, and Vardom. And that's because need to fill interstitial regions. With resin. All right. I have never seen 3D pre -break. You can buy 2D woven prepreg. You want to buy a, a prepreg twill weave? Plenty of it out there, all right? If you want to buy a unidirectional prepreg, whatever you want probably exists. Three-dimensional prepreg, I've never seen it. I don't want to say that it doesn't exist because there's probably some crazy professor somewhere who's like trying to make 3D woven prepreg in his lab, like mad scientist, rawr, but I, I've never seen it, all right? Uh, so that eliminates vacuum bagging methods, pretty much. It doesn't eliminate it, but uh, I guess if you wanted to like take this fabric, dip it in a vat of resin, so now you have this fabric that is just like dripping with epoxy and then you want to put that on some mold and try to do vacuum bagging with it like good luck i mean you could probably try that but 
God damn, that, that's not going to turn out well for you. I'll tell you that right now. Um, so I only would advise if you're going to work with these 3D composites in the future, Vardom, RTM, those are really your only options. Transfer molding techniques. Okay. Now, I've mentioned that these 3D composites lack in-plane properties and have tremendous fracture properties. That's why you would want to use these because you've got this like through thickness toe that's holding everything together. So because it's got this extra third dimension of reinforcement, it's going to eliminate openings that occur between individual layers and stop cracks that might propagate between individual layers. So as a good scientist might say, show me the data, just like Jerry Maguire. All right. So show me the data. Why would we use these convince me? of their benefits if we're going to sacrifice, let's say, all this volume fraction and all these in-plane properties. All right, so show me the data. You bet. I'm a scientist. That's what I do. All right, fracture properties. If you think about trying to open a crack between layers in a 3D woven composite, you have to work your way through that through thickness toe. So you're going to be thinking about, all right, if I'm trying to open a crack inside of a composite, I'm thinking about an image that looks like this, right? I've got a delamination between individual layers. I've got this through thickness Z toe here, which is eliminating or stopping me from opening this particular layer. So how do we quantify the amount of increase in toughness that we get? Well, we we do that with double cantilever beam testing. So we already saw this in the fracture portion of the class is we make DCBs out of this. We pull it open and we see how much energy is required to open a crack. Now, even if we have this through thickness toe. So let's look at what the data might look like if you made a DCB double cantilever beam out of a 3D composite. So test 3D DCB specimens. And you guys saw a lot of DCB data when you did homework number five. And I'm going to show you here some DCB data from testing of a 3D woven composite. Here we go. All right. So here, this is crack opening displacement. So just to remind you of what the DCB looks like. Here's your DCB. And you're going to pull it open like this. Here's your load. Sometime, sometime later as they say in SpongeBob. Many moments later. This guy's got some opening, P, P. The opening has displaced an amount delta, so that's what you're looking at here. This is delta versus applied force, which is P. And what's gonna happen is if you have this 3D woven structure, you've got this sort of like woven toe that's in here, right? Now what's going to happen is as the crack propagates down, it's going to run into the Zito. At that particular point, it is going to take a massive, massive amount of energy to break open that particular toe. So thinking about like ripping open a sample, you need insane amounts of energy to like basically rupture through those fibers that are running in that third direction. Okay. And what's going to happen is you're going to build, 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 build a bunch of energy until that toe finally breaks. And then your crack just shoots forward like lightning after that energy has sort of been released. So that's exactly what we're seeing in this uh, low displacement curve. All right. So we see this first black line here. This is just a 2D woven composite. All right. There are no Z toes in this guy. And we have the typical steady, stable crack propagation that you might envision for a 2D woven composite. Okay, so steady crack propagation, da, da 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 We load up, here we are, we first start to get some crack opening and then we're steadily opening the crack, opening the crack, opening the crack as we go. Nothing too exciting. You did the analysis on this for problem number two of your fracture mechanics homework, so you're all experts now, right? Right. Now let's look at what happens when we start to incorporate the Z binders, all right, the through thickness toes. And here we're incorporating them at various volume fractions. All right, so 3.8, 7.1, or 9.6% volume fraction. That's just more or less density of the Z toes in the fabric. What you'll see is if you have a lot of Z binders, so here let's look at this blue guy. 
that has 9.6% volume fraction Z binders. What happens, you load this guy, you load this guy, you load this guy. So here we are with loading. And all of a sudden we get pinned now at a location where we're stuck on a Z toe. Building, building energy, and then all of a sudden, bang, just releases all of that energy. And it's a massive amount of energy compared to what you would see in the 2D case. So we know that the amount of energy that gets released during this process is something like the area encompassed by this particular portion of the curve. That was the energy released during that fracture event. And if that crack propagated, you know, a small amount between these fiber toes, we're talking a couple of millimeters, then the energy there is just insane compared to like what a fracture event would be like in this particular guy that has an energy that looks like that. So the change in energy between these two situations for the same crack advance is like 30 times. All right. It's like insane amount. All right. So that's the point. I just wanted to display some real data. Show me the data. All right. As scientists, that's what you should be saying all the time, every day. 3D is better than 2D. Why is it better? Show me the numbers. Show me the data. Show me the information. Trust but verify. I think you're telling me the truth, but show me the money. All right. You can quantify this uh, as a function of this Z binder content, which is also a graph that I kind of like. Show me the money. I hope you guys know what movie that's from. If you don't know what movie that's from, oh, I'm disappointed. Oh, I got a question. Show me the money. So here what we're showing is what is the increase in toughness given a Z binder content, All right? So it's like 0% is this black line and 10% is this blue line. So what is the increase in this mode one opening toughness what we know is G1C, here units of kilojoules per meter squared, it's the idea of energy per crack opening area. In the 2D case, where we have no Z binder content, we see a typical value for uh, what a composite might be. This is like 800 joules per meter squared down here. All right, it's a common value. When you're incorporating these through thickness tough, these through thickness Z toes, it's insane. All right, this is crazy, like how much increase in toughness that you're getting, all the way up to like 6,000 joules per meter squared. You ain't making any 2D composites with 6,000 joules per meter squared toughness, I tell you that. All right, take that to the bank. I don't care if you incorporate thermoplastics. I don't care if you incorporate toughening agents. Even with stitching, you might not even be able to get that high. Like, this is like just an insane value, all right? That's bordering on like what aluminum would be, all right? It's crazy, all right? So... Very high uh, increases in fracture toughness, M ma just massive increases in fracture toughness, all right? And not only do we have increases in fracture toughness with 3D composites, you also have increases in impact resistance. And we don't get a lot of chance to talk about impact toughness in this particular class. Uh, it's a topic that's near and dear to me. I have impacted thousands of composites over, over my graduate career and time with the Army, all right? but. Uh, these 3D composites also insane impact resistance. All right. And so here uh, is another image that kind of shows that impact resistance. So what you're looking at here, this is a, a series of impacted composites. Uh, and these are cross sections of impacted composites and we'll show where the impact occurred and the damage that actually develops. So what you see here, this is a, an impact in what would be a 2D or a 3D woven sort of structure. All right. So the 2D structure, uh, you see all these cracks that sort of form that kind of like emanate from where that impact site is. Uh, and you can see some damage modes that you're kind of familiar with at this point. Uh, here's like a long delamination that runs inside of the piece. Uh, you have here these 45 degree angle cracks. These are called shear cracks. Uh, that form from the impact, et cetera, et cetera. The idea is that you can take this image, which is here, and skeletonize it using some computer algorithms, which I had to write when I was in graduate school, uh, to get you what would be the damage profile or the damage inside of that cross-section. All right. So if you compare the skeletonized damage in the 2D versus the 3D, you get some interesting like results uh, that occur. You see in like the 3D, a lot less transverse shear cracks, right? So here are like some transverse shear cracks, transverse shear cracks, so on and so forth. You have delaminations that are occurring here, 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 
et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the 3D composites, similar idea, like right near the impact site, there are these transverse cracks that are occurring that are inside the piece that maybe like disrupt the load carrying capability in the plane slightly. Uh, and you also have long delaminations that form. All right, but generally what you can see is that the delaminations that form aren't as aren't as widely open. So if you, for instance, like look at this guy, this guy's like open pretty pretty good amount, right? So the opening there is like is like very large compared to let's say like the openings here, not as large. You can quantify this information and show that 3D composites generally have less internal damage from impact than 2Ds than 2D composites would. All right, so 3D less damage at same impact energy. All right, so some cool cross sections there. All right. Now it comes at cost and the cost of using 3D composites relative to 2D composites is the in-plane properties. And again, show me the data. What's the reduction? What's the knockdown? So your in-plane properties might be in-plane stiffness, in-plane strength, like this. And we see a general downward trend. I added this arrow. This arrow is not in the image by the authors. Okay. So what you see here is when we're in the 2D case with 0% Z-binder, you have some baseline level of, let's say, the elastic modulus or baseline level of what is the tensile strength. All right, so a normalized value of one in both situations. As you start adding Z binders to the 3D woven structure, right, more and more density of these through thickness Zetos, you start to see general reductions in the property. All right, so we see this arrow making its way down. And with very high levels of Z binder content, you can reduce strength by like 75%, reduce stiffness by 60%, so on and so forth. So incorporating more of these Z binders, you know, you're eliminating the amount of toes that are just running directly in the plane. So you're reducing your mechanical properties based on the amount of Z binders that you incorporate uh, sort of in this linear fashion. Maybe not exactly linear, but I've kind of drawn a linear line in here. And the authors of this paper say it better than I probably could. So this, this, this guy, these two guys out of, out of Missouri, Cox and Moritz, they they wrote like all the all the books on 3D woven composites. They're 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 the dudes. I've met them. They're great. Uh, in their author's words, I'll let them explain what's going on here. They do it better than I would. All right. Reductions to tensile strength of 3D woven stitched and pin composites attributed to geometrical defects such as waviness and crimping of in-plane fibers. All right. So when you're incorporating this woven architecture, you're displacing these fibers that are in the plane. All right. Strength may also be lowered by fiber breakage during the process, which has been reported for 3D weaving, stitching, and pinning. All right. That's what I've been telling you. All right. When it comes to three-dimensional woven composites, you don't have as many in-plane toes, so you reduce your in-plane properties. And when you do this stitching process or you do this weaving process, you might damage the fibers during the process, which can lead to reductions in stiffness and strength. All right. So there you go. Right from the horse's mouth. All right. Right from... Show me the data, right? Listen to your scientists. The world would be better, a better place and a healthier place right now if more people listen to their scientists. All right. So that's it. That's all I'm going to really give you on woven composites. Uh, I've got a kind of like a summary slide that sort of wraps everything up on the back end. Um, you can take a look at that. This is sort of in the notes. And it really details like what I think is all of the benefits and drawbacks of all of the different architectures, right? So go to the notes, check out this benefit drawback list that I put together for you guys. Um, and it really kind of compares 1D to 3D. So here we have 1D, here we have 3D. And then we say that like 2D is the Goldilocks, somewhere in the middle that has benefits and drawbacks of both, all right? So, you know, things I've already said, 1D composites, highest volume fractions possible, best in-plane properties, 
easy to automate fiber placement, good drapeability, easiest analytics, easy to repair if damaged. That's something I didn't even really talk about, but uh, repairing of composites, we don't even really have time to get into in this class. Um, but drawbacks of 1D composites, no toughness, no through thickness reinforcement. So impact damage is bad, interlaminar toughness is bad, no Z direction stiffness and strength. All right, we know this about our laminates in general. 3D composites make up for those things. Impact damage tolerance, insane. Interlaminar fracture toughness, insane. Z directional properties, pretty good. Shear properties are good. We didn't really talk about shear for laminates because they're thin, but it is another consideration that you might need to have. Um, so take a look at this list. Make sure that you know this list. Things like that are on this list will come up on your on your test. All right. Last thing is I do have an, a, an example problem that looks at the math behind woven composites, but generally what I'll say is that if you know the character of a woven composite and you know the mechanical properties of that particular composite, then just go with the lamina theory that we've already done. All right. Here's our mechanical property analysis. And I think one thing that I should say is that a lot of times people would consider a 0, 090 laminate, right? So one made from unidirectional fabric this way, unidirectional fabric this way, 0, 090. Some people say that that's the same as a plane weave structure that has like over, under, woven, All right? So consider 0, 090 laminate and plane weave woven. All right. So here are the, the sketches that you might want to have in your mind. All right. Plane weave woven, looks something like that. OK, you've got this like over under. Here's your warp toe maybe, and then the weft toe is coming in and out of the plane. And you'll compare that to what would be like this 0, 090 laminate, where they're just stacked directly on top of each other. Okay, so this is the difference between what is like a 0, 090 and a plane weave cross section. Now, you may consider the analysis methods for these guys to be the same, but they're really not. And that's because sort of this woven pattern where you have like over under toes with each other, they like reinforce themselves when you pull on them. And there's a lot of craziness that happens because of the waviness of the toes. Like, there's shear forces that occur that you don't have with the unidirectional case. There's there's all sorts of different types of loading on the fiber over here than there are here. All right, more complex loading on fiber. All right, this is simple. You got fibers running in one direction. They're not crimping on each other. There's no complication. Um, there is another difference here, and that one of these is symmetric and one is not. All right. This here is not symmetric. So in this case, BIJ would not be equal to zero, your B matrix. This guy is symmetric. So BIJ is equal to zero for one layer of this plane weave material, right? So there are some subtle differences. And unfortunately, it's pretty difficult to predict what the properties of a woven composite will be if you just have the constituent properties. And that's because the way that they're woven together will really dictate a lot of the final property behavior, all right? So I will say, if given constituents that will make up a woven composite, it is difficult to predict composite properties. So when we were talking about unidirectional composites, when we just had fibers running in one direction, if I gave you like 
the fiber property is this, the matrix property is this, give me a prediction of what the lamina stiffness will be in the one direction and the two direction. Okay. You go to help and sigh, you go to rule of mixtures and the way you go, you can tell me what the modulus in the one and the two direction will be fine. No problem. You cannot do that with woven composites because there is an additional like fudge factor that comes in because of the way that the structure is woven together. So if I tell you, all right, I've got glass fibers running in this direction and Kevlar fibers running in this direction, the glass fibers have this mechanical performance, the Kevlar has this mechanical performance, then I infuse it with this resin, estimate what the elastic modulus will be in the one direction and the two direction. Okay, it's actually really difficult to do, okay? Because you have like interactions in the one direction with the glass fiber, but then there are Kevlar fibers across that direction. And then here you have Kevlar fibers in this direction uh, and glass fibers across that direction. OK, so you've got like really complicated loading going on and these fibers are like interlocked with each other. So trying to predict what the material, what the what the composite properties will be based on just the materials alone is like really hard to do because you don't have information about, let's say, the level of crimp of the fibers or the radius of curvature of the fibers in the weaving process or um, how much fiber breakage there was during weaving and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's it's really difficult to predict it beforehand with just the properties of the constituents alone. Okay, so usually you need an experiment. And that's usually what's done. And fortunately, this has been done for a lot of different materials. So people manufacture one layer of like a woven 2D structure, you know, infuse it with resin and then test it in this direction, test it in this direction, determine what is the modules here, what is the modules here, report those values and then feed that into like the lamination theory. So once you have E1, E2, Nu12, G12, then use limit of theory. All right, so we'll just assume that we know E1, E2, Nu12, G12 of that particular layer and use lamina theory. Okay, so let's say I have a plane weave and I lay it down here. It's my zero direction, it's my 90 direction. Like away you go. You can use all the all the, the theory of lamination that we've that we've discussed previously. All right. So I've got an example problem that's in the notes. It's looking at uh, a woven composite material with a, an applied bending moment and how you might analyze that. And I'm going to say that you know what the properties of a single layer of that fabric are, uh, E1, E2, Nu12, G12, et cetera. And you can go through the analysis to determine, let's say, how much strain is going to result on that particular piece if you were to apply a bending moment to it. So uh, check the notes for the example. Um, gives you a general flavor on how to do the analysis with woven composites. You just assume that you understand what E1, E2, Nu12, and G12 are, and then you just power your way through, calculate the ABD matrices, figure out what the loads are on the structure, away you go. Stuff that we did weeks one through six. All right, that's the general idea. That's it today. I was hoping to intro sandwich composites a little bit today, but I guess that'll have to wait until Friday. So um, thanks again for coming. We'll see you guys, uh, see you guys on Friday.